broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world. The Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blog Talk Radio, uh, churchmilitant.tv, mic'd up. Our apologies right out of the gate here. We were supposed to start at 8 o'clock Eastern. Our apologies. We had yet another uh, foul-up by the uh, software from Blog Talk Radio. Not our problem. We didn't do it. Sometimes we make goofs, but injustice and charity <laughs> for ourselves. We want to say that this one was not our fault, again, like so many of them, because we got to get in touch with these blog talk people and say, hey, guys, you need to make your software more reliable. So our apologies for any of you that had tuned in at 8 Eastern, uh, or again, you know, sometimes these things happen. We have no idea what's going on with blog talk, but here we are. So uh, apologies accepted, blog talk. Thank you. Uh, we're here to talk tonight with uh, Father Z, Father John Zulsdorf of uh, what does the prayer really say? A wonderful website. Uh, Father, how are you? Well, I'm doing well. Uh, Michael, how are you? Well, uh, now we're better. We have you online live. We're here live. So uh, now now we're doing much better. Thank you. Uh, Father Z, as uh, many of you know uh, who listen to him and uh, and read his blog. Father, how many hits do you get a day on your blog? You're, you're tremendous. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, when you get into the, the, the technical... Um, you know, the terminology about hits or visits or page loads and, and that kind of thing. Um, I guess I'm getting somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 25,000 uh, unique visitors a day. Which is awesome because uh, Father and I have got to know each other uh, pretty well in the last maybe six months or so. And uh, he is... Uh, uh, for those of you who somehow inexplicably might not know about Father Z and his blog, I urge you greatly to go read it. He is a wealth of information, a very, very dedicated priest whose uh, heart and mind are very much with the church and needs to, uh, uh, if, he, if he's got it, you know, Father, my mom used to have an expression, what such and such doesn't, uh, doesn't know isn't worth knowing. Well, <laughs> I would say that of you and your blog, what Father Z does not know is not worth knowing. So uh, uh, that's kind of you. Now you know. Now that now that you sent people to the blog, um, I've got to I've got to say that I've been having blog problems today. It's been oh. down. It's been <laughs> slow, and and you know, of course, you had problems getting the, the, the this program up today. And I understand that um, even you know Drudge today was having a problem, and uh, a couple of other site, conservative sites have been having a problem. And, um, you know, this, this gives me an opportunity to talk about um, Zulsdorf's law. <laughs> Zulsdorf's, the, the, first, the first absolute axiom of Zulsdorf's law is that Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> and that whenever you need to do anything with technology, and this is where we get into Zulsdorf's law, <laughs> anything, anytime you need to do something with technology, that is the moment when it will fail you. Yes. And the extent of the failure is directly proportioned to the urgency of the need of the technology, right? Yes. So, uh, this, everybody out there will understand what happens uh, when, this, when this happens. For example, you get a brand new gadget or a brand new bunch of software, and you want to show someone, right? You say, hey, look at this great thing. And that is exactly the moment when it won't work. Yep. That's, yeah, for example, if you want to start your show at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. And, 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 and probably the reason why it happened is because you're having me on, right? Because it's Zolzdorf's law. You know, there's a funny little joke around the studio here, you know, for all the, uh, you know, our Internet savviness and all that. That does not apply to me, Michael Voris. I walk by any editing computer here in the studio or sit in front of any of these contraptions and they break, melt down. All of a sudden the technology fails. It's, it's, so, yeah, I, it's, I, it's, I, I think the combination of you and me, Father, I think that's uh, probably pretty bad. <laughs> Very bad combination. So, uh, anyway, Michael, now that we've got that all of the way, anything interesting? Interesting going on in the church these well, days? Well, you know, what? not really. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a resignation by a pope and uh, things like that. But uh, uh, 
Uh, uh, I would, yeah, we're getting. I'm starting to see a trend. You know, every <laughs> 600 years or so. You know, actually, there's a funny thing here. We have a uh, Phil, our crack researcher, put together uh, a list of all of the papal resignations uh, that have happened uh, since all the way back to the third century. And here's something kind of funny uh, that there have been nine. Uh, Benedict the 16th will be number 10 total. Now, some of these are kind of, I mean, it's a little sketchy whether to call it a resignation or not, because they were forced out by the Roman emperors of the time. But eh, if you have to put them under some category, they didn't die in office. They they didn't complete their term either. So we just kind of, resignation is the only thing we can come up with. But the funny thing is that uh, uh, two of them were called, took the name Gregory, which is the last one to uh, uh, have resigned, Gregory the Twelfth in the 15th century. Uh, two of them are Gregory, but also two of them are Benedicts, Benedict the Fifth and Benedict the Ninth. So now uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth has, so, so to speak, broken the tie. Now, of the ten popes that have resigned from office, uh, three of them were Benedict. So a uh, little piece of trivia there for uh, all our Catholics tuning in. Um, um, well, you know, it's like anybody who is interested in baseball, right? <laughs> I mean, these little bits and pieces of information show trends right, over a long period of time. Yeah, that's, uh, so if the next guy names, uh, next cardinal calls himself Benedict, well, well may- maybe it won't be another 600 years. <laughs> maybe we better hope for a Leo. <laughs> yeah, maybe a Leo the 14th, maybe? Well, let's like, like shift, there you go. Let's shift gears and, and talk about uh, the, uh, now correct me, Father, I'm going to say it wrong, uh, Papabile, right? Papabile? Well, papabili is how papabili. Pap- <laughs> if you're if, if it's going to be plural, it's papabili, and if it's singular, it's papabile. And for those, for those of us who so consider the, um, butcher, these are the men who are considered by some people to be good candidates uh, and, and likely likely candidates, rather than preferred candidates. If you get my drift, yes. Yeah, so yeah. so sometimes let's... people don't make this they don't make this distinction very well. For example, if I put on my blog. You know, who do you, if I were to put on my blog, um, whom do you think they will elect? There will be immediately a hundred comments from people saying, well, I want them to elect this guy. Right, right. right? So, <laughs> so we have to make a distinction always between whom, you know, who is likely to be elected and whom you would prefer to be elected. Do you think that, uh, in your experience, Father, and, and again, for those people who, you know, again, few people might not know who you are uh, uh, or know that you come with, you come to this discussion with a very unique uh, background. You, you know an awful lot of what's going on in the church behind the scenes and, uh, you know, have various people you're in contact with constantly of whose names we shall not reveal because people in the journalistic world, even on the fringes of it, don't do that sort of thing. They never give away their sources. But having said that, the information that your sources may have given you, uh, are you familiar with this, uh, this document that just came out this past week, uh, or actually made its rounds on the Internet this past week, by a Father Darius Oko, who's a Ph.D., he's a p- priest in Poland, and he's, it's about a 38-page document. I'm holding it here in my hand for uh, anybody watching on the video. He called his uh, article slash document report with the Pope against the homo heresy. And apparently there is a great deal of concern in Poland on the part of many members of the hierarchy in Poland that what Father Oko here, again a Polish priest, is his term, the homo heresy, that this kind of invasion into the clerical world in Poland of a uh, what he calls a homosexual lobby. Uh, they're very concerned about it, destroying the faith and that sort of thing. But interestingly, in his report here, he branches out beyond Poland and makes a point of how difficult uh, it has been for uh, cardinals and even this pope. He has a section in here on Pope Benedict XVI and how he's had to be doing battle uh, with various, uh, what he calls the homo mafia, the homo lobby, those are his words, his terms, uh, and that uh, he just ran out of gas, the, the, the Pope and his age, and he just ran out of gas fighting the liberal elements in the church, many of which are this whole homosexual lobby in the clerical world and that sort of thing. Do you think that there is any uh, validity, not necessarily to Father Oko's report, I just wanted to make people aware of that, but 
but that part of this whole thing about uh, the Holy Father resigning is that he just sort of ran out of gas having to do this constant battle. Uh, it's enough just to try to administer the church with, you know, 6,000 bishops and 1,300, whatever it is, religious orders and universities and all that business. But when you've got so much opposition from within, it just wears you out, doesn't it? Well, sure. It, it, it's enough to... What, what, what he would have to do every day is, someone, is something that would, that would wear out a guy half of his age. And he's in his, you know, he's in his mid eighties, uh, for crying out loud. And, and you gotta, you gotta imagine what kind of cares that he has every single day. He has to meet with heads of dicasteries. He has to meet with heads of state. He has to meet with ambassadors. He has to have public appearances and all of these things are wearing. And, um, you know, he's been doing it for a while. He's, his, uh, not everyone is is gifted with perfect health, you know, through their 80s. Let's remember what what uh, Scripture says. You know, the man's years are 70 and 80. If you're strong, he's already beyond the the, the biblical age. And uh, and uh, you know, I mean, obviously, if if you're constantly uh, fighting the kinds of wars that this or, or on, on the various battlefronts that the Pope has seen and talked about and, you know, during this pontificate, of course it's going to wear a guy out. I mean, how could it not? So, you know, some people have, have opined that perhaps um, his, uh, you know, he, he is, he's resigning because of his health. Some people are opining that he's resigning because he can't get anything done in the Curia anymore or that he has to fight too hard and too long to get anything done. Well, you know, either one of those will play on the other, won't they? You know, I mean, if you're constantly fighting, it wears you out. If you if you get worn out, you can't, you know, fight as hard and hold the line as much. Well, sure, all of these things are going to weigh on a guy that age, aren't they? Sure they will. Sure they will. We had a couple of emails come in here, and I thought this would be a very good, uh, very good question to throw your way. Um, some people are saying that, uh, you know, Pope Benedict has been the friendliest uh you know, Pope toward the traditional Latin Mass in a you know a good long while. Is there any danger? They're asking that the next Pope would come in and somehow, uh, you know, reverse the motu proprio or allow it to stand, and then but just sort of you know let the life drain out of it. Is there any concern for in that question? Well, I'm not uh, concerned about that uh, personally. Uh, I don't think that the next Pope uh, would do that. Um, why? Why would he? Um, you know things are are things are going along pretty well with uh, with it. There's slow but steady growth. I think some people are impatient to have faster you know gains in this regard, but there has been slow and steady growth. I saw some figures the other day from uh, the, the the coalition in support of Ecclesia Day. You know who Mary Krejci is, right? Mm-hmm. Who has done some. <laughs> So much work for so many years. I read something from her the other day about how many uh, more uh, locations have the older form of mass since some more pontificum compared to the number of places that they had added in you know a, a similar period before some more pontificum. It was a huge gain. So there is there is some slow, steady growth, and uh, a new generation of priests. Um, and, and people are coming up who are interested in these things. And the Holy Father framed it very well um, in, as far as the, the juridical uh, basis for this. He, you know, extended faculties. He said that if you have, you know, if a priest is in good standing, he's able to say mass and he has faculties and so forth, then he should be able to use this, uh, this right uh, as well. You know, he automatically has the faculties to say uh, the older form of mass also. So why would a pope come in? I mean, cui bono, right? Why would he come in and, and, and mess around with that and just create for himself a, a, a problem when he's going to be facing all these other problems that he has to face in the church? I mean, why would he do that? So I, I, don't, I don't see, particularly when I think of some of the, the, the people whom they're talking about as papabili, um, you know, likely candidates, 
I, I just can't. I just can't see any of them walking it back. Could a pope do it? Well, sure he could because he is, you know, supreme so jurisdiction. He's a pope, <laughs> right? He, right. He could, yeah. He could draw a line through the motu proprio or cancel those things out or change those things around. Sure he could. But would, would he? I mean, why would he? Uh, I, I just don't. I, I just don't see that. Um, this is this is not. Uh, you know, this is not 1983. You know, this is 2013. So I, I just don't see that, that that would happen. What do you think about the... Not only that, there, there's a whole different, there's a whole different attitude now. A whole, during, during Pope Benedict's uh, pontificate, we've seen a, a different attitude develop about the, the Second Vatican Council and about the liturgical reforms that took place during and after the council. Uh, people are are more freely able to raise questions, um, some very challenging questions. Uh, there is a, a common uh, understanding now that maybe some things did get kind of out of control, and maybe we have to reconnect them with our tradition. We have to apply that hermeneutic of of reform and continuity that the Holy Father spoke about. Um, so very early in his pontificate, one of the most important things he ever did in his pontificate, that great address to the Roman Curia in 2005. And uh, the, people are beginning to, to talk about it, how we actually applied the council, what does it all mean, where might it have gone wrong, what needs to be improved. People are able to talk about these things now in a rational way, which wasn't possible even, I would say, even, you know, uh, ten years ago. Yeah, I was going to say, but even ten ten years ago, yeah, yeah, you couldn't even begin to say anything about Vatican II, and not necessarily the Council per se, but even anything that happened after it. You, you, I mean, you know this. You you say anything, and people start running around waving, "Oh, you're defying the Church," and this and that, and, and it's like, "Well, wait, no, no, I'm not. I'm trying to say that something seems amiss here. You know, by their fruits you will know them. You know, seventy five percent of Catholics don't go to Mass." So, you know, if the, whole po- if, if the whole point of the council was to inspire evangelization, well, it did a horrible job of it. Yeah, and even, even on some of those, you know, negative points where we look around and we, we see the, the, the difficulties that there have been since the council. Just the other day, um, very soon after uh, Pope Benedict announced that he would be stepping aside, uh, he had this meeting in the Paul VI audience hall with the clergy of the Diocese of Rome. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the Bishop of Rome, and he met with his, with his priest. And in, you know, off-the-cuff remarks, he talked about some of the difficulties that have resulted uh, after the, the Second Vatican Council. And yeah, he, called them, he called them calamities. That, that's, that's quite a strong word. That he used the word, used the term calamities. I think it's true. I think it's indicative, but it's it's. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going to contradict the Holy Father on that point. <laughs> so uh, you know, he, he uses the word calamities. Um, you know, fine. I'll I'll be happy to to work with that word. But you know, when we have we look around and we see that there are problems, and um, and somewhere along the line, we haven't seen uh, the. The, all of the fruits that were hoped for, for uh, since the Second Vatican Council, and I think it's legitimate to ask why, and if when, what do we need to do to, to, to you know, produce those fruits that, that were hoped for? Well, maybe we need to get back actually to the, the, the source documents and find out what the Council really said, and uh, take a look at it very, very carefully and with a critical eye and have a little bit of cold blood in our veins for a little while. And as we look at these documents objectively and we look at the fruits objectively. Let me ask you, Father, if you were to look at, uh, you know, if you were to identify, you know, two, maybe three things on, on your list of, wow, these are the things that have happened after the Council uh, that we really need to uh, address, look at, you know, put, you know, push the pause button on and go back and take a much deeper look at, what would those maybe top two, or if you want to go to a third one, what would they be in your book? Well, for me, always at the, at the top of my list is always our liturgical worship of God. Um, you know, if, Why? Why? Well, the, well, I put it this way. Because of the virtue of, by the virtue of justice, we have to give to 
people what is due to them, right? Yes. You, you, you always give to another person what is his due, and that's what we do because of the virtue of justice. Now, God is a person, and, but God is a divine person. So we still have a, 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 we have a similar thing. We have to give God what is his due. But because God is qualitatively different as a person, we, we have virtue of religion, right, by which we, we are bound to give God that which is God's due. And the first thing that we owe God is worship. And so, you know, this is the, because God is God, he's at the hierarchy, the summit, the pinnacle of all of our relationships. We have to have our relationship right with God before we can have the, our relationship right with everybody else uh, in, in the world. And so if, if, we have, if we have as an individual uh, screwed up our relationship with God or if, we have, or if we are not giving God that which is his due as an individual or as a group or as a whole church, then that has ramifications for the whole life of the church. So we have, to, we have to revitalize our liturgical worship, which is what we owe to God, is the, the primary thing that we owe to him. And, and so um, I don't think that we can undertake uh, uh, successfully any real effort of revitalization of any aspect of the church's life if we do not also um, first and foremost, do what we can to rectify, uh, bring into continuity, uh, re-energize, revitalize, use all these fancy words that you want, but get our liturgical worship squared away, get it back together, get it into continuity with the way that we've always prayed. This is something that the Holy Father has tried to do by both example and in his writing and in his preaching and in his legislation through some more pontificum, right? He's been very focused on liturgical worship for many, many years in his writings, his preaching, his example. And so um, this is one of the, I think this is the, the, a, a key point uh, to, to what happened after the council that we have to really attend to. All other things, I think, then begin to flow from that because, because we have a, because there's a reciprocal relationship between how we pray and what we believe. If you if you pray a certain way, you begin to believe certain things. If you believe certain things, then that means you're going to pray in a certain way. And this is expressed in this in this old term that so many people know, lex orandi, lex credendi, that the law of praying is the law of believing. So there's a reciprocal relationship between belief and prayer. Change one, you change the other. The change, you know, takes place slowly over time, right? But it will change the way you believe sure, in things. which is kind of the point. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, that's right. And, and so um, when we change uh, our liturgical worship, then that's going to have ramifications for the, all the rest of the, the life of the church. If we lose, for example... Uh, the strong transcendent component to our liturgical worship that I think we need, if we turn it into kind of an immanentism light, you know, where it's all about us. Sure. Um, and we're and we're not really bothered about thinking about a God that's transcendent. Yeah, sure. We'll you know if we're pushed to it, maybe we'll admit that God is transcendent out there somewhere. But but the people aren't giving it any thought anymore because they haven't had transcendent worship in their lives for maybe all their lives or at least decades then that has a knock-on effect in all of the different aspects of the church. Why should we be a missionary? Why should we uh, uh, be, a, be a Catholic married couple instead of just a secular married couple? Why should I go to confession? Uh, why should I bother learning my faith, you know, the catechism, uh, my catechism, you know, that faith, that, that faith in which we believe is going to be affected by the faith by which we believe. And if we've if that's been enervated somehow because of our liturgical worship being enervated or, or made imminent in some way, well then you know these all, these have knock on. This has a knock on effect for every sphere in the church's life. So far, so, and so me, for, if so, I can, so, you know, holy, hold the way the way the way we celebrate the sacraments, especially uh, uh, the you know holy mass and and approach the Eucharist. Um, our, this is going to be a, a key point. Then other points, you know, I mean, preaching, which is also uh, connected to mass, 
catechism, uh, the sacrament of penance. Oh, for the love of God, we have to do something about the sacrament of penance. There are, there are various things like this, you know, which have a knock-on effect, are, are knock-on effects from getting that, that, that foundational relationship right. Well, let me ask you, Father, is, uh, you know, again, with your insight in this, Cardinal Burke uh, uh, was present at it, the launch of an Italian book. Uh, uh, this was probably about a year ago, I think now, maybe. I think it was last summer, year ago summer. Uh, and the name of the book in Italian was uh, uh, How the Mass Can Make You Lose Your Faith. Uh, now, I don't know if it's been translated into English or not, but he took a lot of heat and he got a lot of press, some of it good, some of it bad, for actually standing there next to the authors that book was launched. And he subsequently said in an interview to that, and another cardinal, I believe it was Cardinal Ranjith, I might be wrong on the cardinal, but it was definitely Cardinal Burke and another cardinal, said that they, many other people in Rome... Uh, in the hierarchy and as, as lay people as well, and in particular Pope Benedict, were just shocked at the resistance around the world on the part of bishops to reinstituting or revivifying the traditional Latin Mass. They couldn't believe the rebellion, the 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 just open. No, we're not going to do this. And when they finally did, I mean, you know, tracing the history of this, you know, John Paul had said. Uh, you know, to the bishops, you know, you know, be generous to the people for the mass, and you know, the bishops ignored it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Benedict comes along and writes the, you know, here we're going to do this, and you know, they gets ignored, and finally he says, hey, you're going to do this, and then he issues the uh, the motu proprio, and then he has to send a follow up letter with it saying, you will do this. These people want this; they have a right to it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the mass of the ancient mass. It's the mass of saints, the mass of the ages. And yet, continually, we hear, I'm sure you do all the time, that there is this, this rebellion, there is this wall of rebellion on the part of many bishops, so much so that cardinals in the church are coming out saying they're flabbergasted at this, uh, at this resistance to the, to the Mass. Why do you think that is? And by the way, a lot of this has happened in the United States. Why do you think this is the case? Well, I mean, everything you've just said, you've laid out beautifully, makes perfect sense. Surely, uh, you know, it, you know, if you realize this about the faith, surely the you know bishops and cardinals realize this about the faith. Why is there? Do you think such resistance to the traditional Latin Mass among so many of the hierarchy? Well, um, look, you know, I think there are some several factors to this, and. And we can we can chalk some of this up, I think, simply to to the human di- dimension of the church. You know, here I, I've thought about this every once in a while, and, and and come to a conclusion as I get as I get older, and I want fewer and fewer problems. Some days, I can understand. I can have a certain measure of sympathy for bishops who also want fewer and fewer problems on their desk because they have an avalanche of problems that they have to deal with every day. And one of the reasons I think that there has been a resistance on the part of some bishops is because maybe in their encounters with uh, more traditionally minded, uh, they've had a negative experience. And uh, because it, it's entirely possible for uh, some, you know, the more uh, traditional um, leaning in the, in the church to, to rub uh, those whom they perceive to be on the other side the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, the, first thing, the first thing that a uh, diocesan bishop might think is, oh, my heavens, you know, here comes, you know, headache number 34 for the day. And they don't want to have anything, you know, more to do with it. That's there's a that's a human explanation. Okay, another another human explanation too is that a lot of these guys grew up in uh, and they were formed as young people or as priests, um, or you know, uh, even you know, for some of the older ones as, as even maybe young bishops in that Halcyon period after the council when the spirit of the council was was you know, guiding everyone to, you know, uh, how do you want to put it, pitch the baby out with the bathwater sure, or sure. You know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, when we were throwing everything out. Yeah, yeah. And um, they, were, they were all caught up in that, right? 
they were caught up in that. And, and there are a lot of guys, and this is another thing I realize as I'm getting older too, and I get a little bit more resistance to change in, in my own life. Some of these guys had one big change in them. You know, they had one big change and they said, okay, this is the way the church is going to go, is going. This is what, this is what the church wants from me. And I'm going to shift from this mode to this mode now. And for them to consider going back to what there was is a great challenge to their identity as, as, as men, you know, as, and, their, and their life's work and who they've been as priests all their lives. That's interesting you would bring up that example, Father, because we had John Zamirak on the show here probably uh, uh, about a month ago or something. Uh, and and he made the uh, I'm sorry Dave Carlin who wrote the book uh, the the decline and fall of the Catholic Church in America uh, and he made that same point that you know if you're gonna you know these guys kind of went into seminary or maybe the, you know they were baby priests and uh, and then this whole you know 1960s you know craze halcyon days of change this and change that hit and they moved from kind of their neutral accepted this is the way things are position and they committed themselves intellectually, psychologically, emotionally, theologically to some extent, uh, and there they are. And they're, you kind of have to ask them to sort of go back and undo what they've been part of creating. And, yeah, and, and it's, it's a challenge to their identity. And now, you know, when you start to think about the times and how they were a change in, um, these, are, these are people who were uh, very, you know, very many of them were, their whole personality and their perception of social issues and interaction and who they were as Catholics was shaped in the time of the great, of the civil rights movement, right? Mm -hmm. The civil rights protests, the anti-war protests, uh, to a certain extent, the, uh, the, you know, the sexual revolution, all these things were roiling around and men are men of their age, aren't they? I mean, we, we, we're, we're influenced by the age we live in. And so what happens is that all of this experience, the Catholic thing from the one hand and the other social movements going on in the other, fused themselves together in the minds, in the worldview of a lot of these people of a certain age. And so, for example, when, you, when they see a Beretta, you know, the hat that a priest wears during the traditional mass, or they see the old style of vestment, or they hear any Latin, or the clink of an incense chain, or something like that. <laughs> this this takes them back to a point where they are were were being formed to beware of authority, resist authority, resist the man who's bad, you know, mm -hmm. resist the you know, be, be, this this challenges them at the at the very their very identity. They, they, it, because then what happens is that the Second Vatican Council and all the things having to do with the spirit of the council have taken on a kind of a mythic, iconic role in their minds. And to bring up, uh, to suggest that you could use Latin, even in the Novus Ordo, or a Beretta, or they see a maniple, or something like that. And it is a real challenge to their identity, because they can't separate it from that whole experience of growing up in the civil rights movement, the anti-war protests and the whole thing, you know? And so, so for people of a certain age, and these are people who have, you know, men, men who have been in, in leadership positions in the church for a long time uh, uh, after the, you know, up, up to, to now, I mean, now we're getting into, you know, younger bishops who, who don't, ha who didn't have that experience because they grew up after that or they're, you know, they're just younger. They're just young enough not to have had that become part of the framework of their worldview. Now, you know, so things are changing now. But for so long, so many of those men grew up in that in that environment, and they had to have been influenced by it in some way. So that's another human, uh, another human explanation of of why sometimes these guys will have a. A, a bad reaction or, or put up such a fight against the suggestion that we should turn the clock back or go back to doing this when that's not actually what people are asking for, but that's how they perceive sure. it. Sure. And it's a direct challenge to their identity and their life's work. 
All right, Father, we're going to take a break right now with Father John Zulsdorf from What Does the Prayer Really Say blog site, a, a great priest with a great, uh, just great information, great insights on all of this stuff. But when we come back, uh, Father Z and I had a chat, uh, this was around Christmas time, Father, wasn't it, uh, about an American pope. So uh, Father has some views on that, and we'll uh, get into that little dialogue when we get back. Since we're talking about the men, many of those men are going to be walking into conclave in the next, uh, you know, who knows, roughly two weeks or so, two, three weeks. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, who we think might step out onto the loggia, the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square. And might it be an American? We'll be right back right after this message. Sick of TV and its cultural rot? Tune in to churchmilitant.tv and become a premium subscriber where you will get access to fresh shows with solid church doctrine. As a premium subscriber, you'll get hundreds of hours of programming, which includes investigative shows, catechesis, apologetics, church history lessons, and a lot more. What are you waiting for? Forget the bad television and dive into the riches of the Catholic faith for only $10 a month. From ChurchMilitant.tv's new series, Right Reason, Dr. Charles Rice explains, Pope John Paul said faith and reason are like two wings on which we rise to the truth. Become a premium member today to gain the right reason to understand your Catholic faith. Michael Voris launched his apologetics mission with his groundbreaking series, The One True Faith. This series, with over 100 hours of orthodox commentary, covers every possible Catholic topic in tremendous detail. To explore The One True Faith, sign up for a premium membership today. All right, we are back with Father Z. Father, you and I were talking over Christmas about uh, uh, an American pope possibility of an American Pope. Well, actually, I guess I was talking about the possibility, and you were saying, Mike, you're crazy. No way. <laughs> Why do you think there would not be an American Pope? No, I'm, I'm not going to, just as I didn't, you know, contradict the Holy Father earlier, I'm not going to con- contradict you now. In saying <laughs> you'll, say, you'll say that in a month. <laughs> yeah, if, if, you, if you want, that's fine. You can be as crazy as you want. So, um, yeah, no, I, look, I, uh, you know, there's an old there's an old proverb in Rome that the that the, the 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 guy who enters into the conclave as pope exits as a cardinal. Correct, correct. So you know, I mean, we can we can speculate all we want. Um, we're very often wrong when we we speculate. Now it just happened to be. It, it just so happens that for the election of Benedict the Sixteenth, I was right. I predicted that he would be elected, but it's. Um, you know, so I've got uh, I've, I've got I won I won for one right now. But um, uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I, I'm I, guessing I, you I'm guessing you whiffed on uh, on John Paul too. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I you see, um, I wasn't uh, uh, I wasn't a Catholic yet, so I am a convert. Remember, so that uh, well, was before my conversion to Catholic Church. So I wasn't really, uh, really terribly interested in it at that time. <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, you know, look, there are all there. There are some good candidates out there, and um, uh, I'm sure that that one of the things they'll be considering is a is a pope from North America. Now, notice that I did not mention the, these United States. That's because America. that's because I you're know. sneaking in Cardinal Roulette from uh, uh, Quebec City. <laughs> I am, yes, indeed, <laughs> and he. We have to, I think, consider that he is, uh, he is one of the candidates. He's one of the papabili, and he um, uh, strikes me as being actually a pretty good candidate. So, let me let me ask let, let me let me ask you. I'll throw out some names for you and just you know speculate. Uh, uh, Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Burke. Haven't nobody has mentioned him at all anywhere in anything, which, of course, you know, if you know Cardinal Burke, you know he's an extremely humble man. He'd probably be horrified if he saw his name in print somewhere saying he's a possibility for the Pope, for the papacy. But, uh, um, you know, whether he were to win specifically or not, or, you know, does the would a man like that be good in the papacy, somebody who knows the lay of the land, he understands what's going on, he's, you know, a great fan of the traditional Latin mass, isn't caught up in all that kind of halcyon madness days of the 1960s and social justice and blah, blah. Is that the type of man that the church needs right now? Not necessarily Cardinal Burke himself, but that embodies the qualities that Cardinal Burke has. What what do you think of that? Well, you know, obviously uh, the, the liturgical, um, the liturgical, 
uh, emphasis that uh, Cardinal Burke has had um, is something that I, you know, personally interested in, and I, I like what he's done. I like what he's doing. I like what he's said and what he's written. Um, he, uh, you know, he's a brilliant canonist, uh, so he understands the church's law. He's had experience uh, both in Rome and as a diocesan bishop and in a couple of different dioceses. Uh, he's got some real experience under his belt. Um, he obviously, uh, you know, knows what the score is and how the Roman Curia runs. And I think that we have to have someone who is going to be willing to really work within the Roman Curia to um, impose, I think, some reforms. Not just promote them or invite them, but I think we have to have some reforms imposed. And you know, whether or not, uh, you know, all of the, and then there are a lot of other issues in the world. You know, I think he understands Pope Benedict's vision uh, as far as the, uh, that hermeneutic, that interpretive principle for the Second Vatican Council that involves continuity rather than rupture and discontinuity. Um, he. Uh, certainly from his uh, vantage point of working, having worked in different Vatican congregations now for a long time, has a pretty good vision about what's going on around the world. And because um, he's not going to be just the Pope of us, you know, I mean, you in Detroit or, you know, us in the United States or wherever, he's got to be Pope, Pope of everyone everywhere, and he's got to have cares from all over the world on his plate. And I think he's probably had a chance to see these things. But then a lot of cardinals who have worked in Syria have that too, because they have to work on different, they have to be members of different congregations, and so they get a real perspective of the universal church. Um, you know, I I think that were he elected, he 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 would give he'd give 250 uh, percent to all of the different things that would fall to him as the vicar of Christ, and he would be able and he would be uh, able. Uh, humbly to ask for the prayers of the faithful in, in carrying out those things. Let me ask you, moving outside of, uh, since we're outside of the European contingent of cardinals right now, uh, if you're to look sort of outside the world, uh, the, the world of Europe, uh, we're hearing Cardinal Turkson's name uh, a lot uh, being mentioned. As a matter of fact, in relation to the uh, the St. Malachi prophecy, and Father, if you know anything about this that, that you could say that could sort of disabuse people and stop playing, you know, prophecy games on the last pope or the last pope's going to be a false prophet or whatever all these things are. Oh, uh, yeah, the Malachi stuff. Yeah, yeah. Malachi. The, ne- the, next po- the next pope is the last pope. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of fun, you know, to look at, but I don't think people should take that all that seriously. And, you know, I mean, they, just, some people have done some pretty loopy things with that. Yeah, well, I mean, you you spend a great deal of time of your life on the internet, and you see all these things like we do. There's people like, oh, it's Peter Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman is the last pope, and and then somebody made the connection that uh, in Cardinal Turkson's uh, home country, uh, he is known as Peter the Roman. Uh, so people are like, oh, that's it, he's going to be elected, and he's going to be the last pope, and then it's the end of the world, and da 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 da. Uh, okay, well, great, Michael. Let's just fuel a little more speculation uh, about that. That's, that's great. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, wow. Okay, good. <laughs> we do like to uh, we like to remind people constantly that to uh, sort of be sticking their noses into when the end of the world is going to be is what our Lord turned around and told the apostles: "Mind your own business." Uh, in 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 pretty un, un uh, pretty uncertain ter- or pretty certain terms too. He was not. Uh, pussyfooting around when he said it. He said, you know, even the son doesn't know. That's something the father reserves to himself. Mind your own business. So uh, I, I, I think a good... Yeah, we have, good, I think just, just making sure that our own houses are, you know, swept and clean and ready for the return of the Lord, you know, that's a, probably all, what we should be focusing on in that point of view. But look, I mean, uh, it, the, the, the prospect of a, of, of a cardinal from, you know, Africa has its um, has very strong, uh, I think, benefits from it. Um, the, the African cardinals whom I've met uh, in, in my years in Rome uh, were out, you know, outstanding uh, men of faith, really faithful men. I mean, really uh, uh, traditional in their doctrine and, and, and very well versed. For example, um, uh, His Eminence Cardinal Lorenze, you know, who is now uh, too old, uh, alas, to go into the Conclave to vote. I got to know a little bit because he is the 
eventually cardinal bishop of my diocese in Italy. And uh, as you know, the, the College of Cardinals is divided into three orders still, the cardinal bishops, cardinal priests, and cardinal deacons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when a man uh, is, you know, gets to a certain uh, uh, position in the Roman Curia, he's often elevated from being a cardinal deacon or cardinal priest to be a cardinal bishop. These are the very important con- you know, heads of congregations. And to them are entrusted, instead of the Church of Rome, uh, a little diocese right around Rome. And once upon a time, they actually ran these dioceses. They were actually the local bishops. But uh, in the time of Paul VI, this became a titular kind of a mm-hmm, thing, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. they would be that even though there's a residential bishop, you know, they'd become the titular bishop, cardinal bishop. And so Cardinal Lorenze uh, took over for Joseph Rossinger. After Joseph Rossinger was made pope, um, Cardinal Lorenze took over. And I've, so I've had some nice conversations with Cardinal Lorenze. I think we've all, all seen his interviews and his wonderful, pithy, cheerful, Little you know ways of 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 you know popping the bubble of <laughs> you know anti church anti you know uh, heretical ideas and things like that. He has a really good uh, kind way to do it, and I've known a lot of these cardinals who are really really strong and really tough in doctrine, and but they bring a they they bring a little bit of a. Uh, a, a different style to the way that they they deal with conflict than um, you know maybe some of us uh, grim uh, northerners. You think that if there was okay, the last two popes have been non-Italians. If the college were to now go outside of Europe and elect a non-European. What do you think the implication? Well, first of all, beyond trying to make a statement, obviously it depends on the person, the man they're electing. But uh, what would that sort of what would that be a harbinger of for the church for the future, and not just that papacy? But I mean, you sort of break. You know, once you sort of, you know, break it once, now you can keep doing it. It's easier to keep grabbing, you know, cardinals, meaning uh, you know, on their way to the pape, uh, on the way to being pope. Uh, it's easier to do it this next time, and it's been. And I don't know because I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure I'm going to admit that uh, that premise because uh, one of the things that the that the next pope is going to have to concern himself with is the Roman Curia, and though the Roman Curia has been internationalized, there are still you know it's still the, called the Roman Curia for a reason. Yeah, it's very it's still Italian, and there's a lot of you know, there are a lot of uh, the dynamics and human relations uh, relationships in it. Um, you know, navigating those souls requires a real understanding of of the the culture of of the curia, the ethos you're you're working in. And so, the next guy, you know, I would hope uh, will understand that and be able to, to navigate those souls a little bit. Um, hope you know perhaps they'll have some curial experience. You know they may go completely outside of the Roman Curia, but you know maybe maybe not. But you know no matter what you see, you know some people are out there kind of um, all enthusiastic about an uh, about a pope from an emer- the emerging church. You know either from South America or Philippines or you know Africa or something like that. But you know uh, because with the idea that the idea that that the emerging church is is going to require so much more uh, energy now that we that we we need to turn our sights away from uh, Europe and focus on the uh, you know on the old church and focus on the new church. I absolutely disagree with that because the the new uh, the the next pope is going to have to deal with Europe and the wealthy West and the northern hemisphere because the problems of the north and the west and the wealthy countries are going to be exactly the same problems that they deal with in the poorer third world or emerging churches, however it is you want to call them. And that is what happens to the faith in our Catholic identity with affluence. That is exactly the point. That is exactly the point, Father, I made in a... uh... I made in a vortex that either yesterday or the day before. When it, you know, obviously, you know, we just got back from the Philippines, and it was alarming. It was alarming as a Catholic to see the great 
uh, uh, American cultural imperialism in the Philippines, just eroding the faith. And I had dinner with a couple of dinner and lunch with a couple of the archbishops there, and it's number one on their mind. Absolutely, sitting right there, you know that 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 the Philippines is this close to becoming America on a cultural level, and that's really saying something. They just passed the contraception law over there. The uh, the uh, Cory Aquino's son, who's the president now, Pinoy, signed it two days after Christmas uh, on the Feast of Holy Innocence, and uh, and brought contraception into the country, which of course means abortion will be right behind. And uh, they're very concerned about it, and it really is something that the who I, I really believe. I'm right with you. I believe the next pope is going to have to take on uh, the cultural, relativistic, uh, you know, hedonistic, secularist empire that has developed in the northern, western, first world countries, and he's going to have to tackle that head on. And a lot of that, unfortunately, has invaded the church as well. So I think, I, yeah, I think certainly, this, this is, certainly, it has. Uh, it's it, you know, I just. Uh, just to track back to that to that point, the the relativism and the all of these other things, the materialism, come from the affluence. Right, right. right. When the more it seems like the more money people have, the less uh, the, the harder it is for them to retain, you know, a Catholic, a strong Catholic identity. Sure. And so, you know, at some point or other, I guess we also have to start talking about um, what it is, you know, about hard Catholic identity or soft Catholic identity. Some people talk about, you know, full throttle Catholicism or strong identity or, you know, versus, you know, a gentler style or a, or a classic approach to Catholic identity or maybe an evangelical Catholicism, for example. Um, you know, what, uh, we're, we're going to have to have this. We're going to have to have this this discussion, and it has to take place. I think within number one, the the wealth, you know, the affluence of our of our culture. What's going to happen if there's an economic downturn and we don't have the faith to underpin? You know, is the faith are people going to return to churches? Um, what happens when we want, you know because we want to increase the wealth and the economic prosperity of third world countries? Well, what happens when they get that? You know, I remember what happened when John Paul II went back to Poland after they had been out of the you know communist bloc for a little bit, mm-hmm. and he really read them the riot act because he he saw what they were doing. They were starting to fall away and fritter away um, the the magnificent new opportunity that they had. You know, and so this is this is what this is what happens when when there's lots of affluence and people get comfortable and they stop thinking about God. Do you? Th- do you, do you think that the there there was a there was a great there was a you know on the other hand the economic downturn or difficulties or, or calamities you know of of a, of a material or you know a physical nature could help drive people back you know to their faith I don't know maybe we need a little chastisement along the way but it seems like you know our, our identity is stronger um, our identity is 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 harder you know hardened I don't know hardened not in the not in a in a bad or a negative yeah, solidi- sense. Solidified, but maybe solidified, armored, yeah, sure, you know, yeah, sure. solidified. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When when we also have some, you know, uh, struggles and, and and oppression and a little suffering and, uh, and things like that. You know, I mean, isn't that the pattern of, of of things? I mean, isn't that how human beings are? We get a little soft and then we, you know, stop thinking about God until we're sick or something. Happens or somebody brings down your twin towers. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's the uh, uh, you know. Look, you get dependent on yourself because you know everything's going going well, and you know it's probably human nature. Granted, human nature has fallen, so this is one of the bad side effects of that. But uh, uh, let me let me ask you some change the topic for just a second, uh, Anya Father. There's uh, reports out now that uh, Pope Benedict is going to issue a motu proprio uh, in favor of making the uh, the conclave be able to be pulled forward if a, if I think I believe it's 50 percent of the uh, uh, of the cardinals vote to actually start the conclave earlier. Of course, normally canon law provides for you know the 15 to 20 days and you know the nine days of mourning of masses for the you know the previous pope who would have you know uh, would have died and then the beginning of the conclave. But since obviously the Holy Father hasn't died and is just resigning his office, that 
calls into question, hey, can the conclave start earlier? And apparently there's reports out in the press now that the Pope is going, he's not going to order it to start earlier. He's clearing the way so that if the cardinals want to start it earlier, they can. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, um, certainly I think, um, you know, obviously the Holy Father has the, you know, the, the authority to, to, um, to change the, the legislation for the interregnum, you know, the final state of a country, he can do that. Um, you know, fine, that's great, let him do that. And then the cardinals um, can decide on their own whether or not they want to do that. You know, move the, move the conclave up, fine. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, from what I've heard, um, some cardinals have voiced their opposition to such an idea because they would you know, prefer to have a little more time perhaps to get to know each other. You know, it's a big college and they're, they don't see each other, you know, all that, all that often. And they got to kind of get to know each other and they're going to have the general congregations and the particular congregations during that, um, that, that period uh, before the conclave when the Cardinals meet and discuss issues having to do with the church. Those are called the general congregations. And, they've got to get to know each other. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable uh, thing to desire. You know, were I a cardinal, I don't know that I'd want to rush directly into the conclave. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, while it would not be disaster not to have a pope at the time of the, the sacred tree to him in Easter, uh, it would be nice, you know, to have, a, to have this resolved before Easter. It would be nice to have uh, the, the cardinals come together quickly and um, in this kind of strange situation that we have with the Pope um, you know, abdicating this position or resigning, however you want to put it. It would be nice to be able to have it resolved quickly rather than drag on. Now, one, uh, one point is that you know, leaving, there, there, there's an argument in favor of leaving things exactly the way they are, and that is when you have an unusual situation like that, or maybe the last thing that you want to do is, um, you know, fool around with the timing of it so that some people might raise objections about the legitimacy of the conclave or whether they did things according to the law properly or whatever. And that, you know, what Pope Benedict is doing, if, if he's going to issue this document that leaves it in the hands of the cardinals to move the date up, according to, you know, how they determine to do it, well, fine. That takes the legal or juridical uh, issues and questions off the table. So, you know, fine. I, I mean, it's whatever they're going to decide to do. Um, you know, I, I, I would, I, you know, it's, there's, that old, there's that old phrase from, you know, Shakespeare, you know, if it were done, uh, when it is done, then for well, it were done quickly. You know? <laughs> right, <laughs> but, right. You know, maybe maybe not exactly the most appropriate quote for for, for a conclave, but um, you know, it's I I'm I, I'm eager to know who the next uh, pope uh, is going to be, so that I can continue to pray for Pope Benedict in his uh, retirement and begin to. Uh, uh, pray for and support uh, in the spiritual warfare of the next uh, Vicar of Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, uh, Father, we've only got about a minute left here. I just want to cover a couple of things very quickly. Uh, Bishop Paprocki, Thomas Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois, issued a wonderful note, I suppose you could call it, uh, explaining, the dif explaining the difference between uh, uh, the Pope resigning versus abdicating. Quite frankly, he just said, look, abdicating is something that you know, a monarch does, and while the Pope does have kind of an aspect of his job of being monarch over Vatican City, he's really bishop, and he's just resigning. Uh, so the, according to Bishop uh, Paprocki, the best way to refer to this is as a, uh, as a resignation. Uh, number two, very quickly, you got 20 seconds to tell us what's life like there in the College of Cardinals. Most of these guys don't know each other, right? People have this idea, oh, they all get together. And, but for the most part, these guys are flung to the far corners of the world, and the only time they ever get together as a body is at this moment. So this isn't just a bunch of guys who already have their preconceived notions and are ready to do something, right? They don't even know each other. Right, and, and you seem to be making an argument for putting the conclave off until the 15-day period instead of moving it up uh, a little uh, earlier. So, 
you know, let them let them make that determination. Once they get together, and who knows, maybe they'll be moved to move it up. Maybe they'll be moved to leave it where it is. But either way, uh, things will they work out. They certainly will. Father, give us your blessing, please, if you could, very quickly. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Bishend of Superbos, et Maneat Semper. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Father. Thank you very much. We'll have you back on the show in the future. God bless. Thank you, and thank you very much, everybody who called in.